Welcome back. Previously, we experienced a great tragedy in the form of our first unplanned colonist death of the playthrough. Annoyingly, it was entirely due to operator error on my part. The death shouldn't have happened, but it did, and we will move on from there. Orlean, fortunately, wasn't really doing anything critical, so as bad as it sounds, it wasn't really the end of the world to lose them. In brighter news, my hydroponic system is ready for installation. In order to keep the area warm, I've thrown in a differential deletion-powered heating system, which will dramatically reduce the energy costs necessary to maintain an acceptable temperature profile, and I've had Goose and Co. assemble a couple spare geothermal generators and a battery bank to power all of the important bits. Now all that's left is waiting on my colonists to build out the hydroponic basins and sun lamps for the first two groups of hydroponic farms. Before anything interesting had happened with that, though, Sapper Raid 627 pops, forcing me to muster a response. Normally, I wouldn't even bother recording these by this point, since raids are all kind of same-ish and boring, but Sapper Raid 627 consists entirely of melee-wielding tribal units for some reason, and I thought you'd all appreciate just exactly how much they're going to get dumpstered. It actually turns out that all melee build 627 versus a dozen charge rifles doesn't get to happen, though. Instead, this batch of extremely intelligent tribal units is extremely intelligent, and decides they want to avoid my turrets by tunneling around them. Into my freezer. My, where am I going to fit all this liquid helium? Freezer. But wait, there's more. About half of the raiders realize that attempting to break through the structural personification of Super Antarctica is unwise. So where do they go? Why, the turret box, of course! Truly, the tactical coordinator of this raid had one of the ideas of all time when they planned this one out, didn't they? I also get some nice prisoners out of it though, so that was neat. Randy is messing with me at this point. He sent a siege, which I don't care about, followed immediately after the pact by manhunting Megasloths. Gee, I sure do wonder who's going to win this engagement. Let's just get the freezer ready for some, uh, freeze-dried Megasloths, shall I? The sad part is that if the siegers played it smart, they would have had a chance at winning this. Sadly for them, someone gave the trigger-happy one a pocket nuke. It missed, and the rest is slightly irradiated history. You're, uh, really fielding some Darwin candidates today, aren't you, Randy? Meanwhile, my yak farm has become something of a victim of its own success. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but... Good heavens, I have too many yaks. Why is this allowed? I feel like at this point, the final boss of the game is not, in fact, all of the extremely angry pawns that want to kill me. It is my yak farm, and trying to manage logistics in such a way to prevent the unholy eldritch animal product abomination from covering my base. I have so much milk and meat right now that my entire raw food stockpile is full. My overflow stockpile is full. My yak farm itself is full, because we have nowhere to store the overflowing swamp of yak milk. My butchering station is full. It's nothing but a pile of yak meat 8 meters in radius ballooning out in the middle of a wall. I've had to switch my colony over to fine carnivore meals. Not because I care about fine meals, but because I need to crank through this stuff fast enough to survive the resulting meat explosion, and that still isn't enough. Also, like, can we, can we please stop digging up corpses? I... just... why? There's like 40 corpses to choose from in that freezer alone. Why are you digging up the one I want to keep? The only way I see to keep up with this incredible waterfall of money is to upgrade the last thing I have access to upgrade. My pawns themselves. The first to receive a makeover is, of course, Goose. They can do so many things so well by this point that they're basically a drop-in replacement for nearly any task I need done, so I spare no expense with them. If it can be upgraded for even a marginal improvement in productivity, it is. Out of desperation, I also started cramming down banks of shelving in a dead space north of my trade beacon just to hold things. I have no intention of ever selling raw resources to traders other than maybe pelts, so there's no reason to keep any of it in the room with the trade beacon. 
This lets me clear all of the stuff out and replace it with some of that overflowing excess of animal hide that's been building up without respite, so that I can hopefully do something useful with it. Relief finally comes in the form of a bulk goods trader. Come, trader, and save me from the failings of my own hubris through massive price markups and an infinite inventory capacity. As a side note, by the way, negentropic freezer installations in the hydroponics farm do have one other use. They make eliminating blighted crops like really, really easy, because all you have to do is freeze the room down to absolute zero and the blight magically goes away. Along with all of the plants, admittedly, but you know, they were toast anyway. Welcome to the colony Helios. You get to be a hauler and a cleaner. This is not a downgrade, I'm serious, this is the single most important job in the colony right now because you fight a threat greater than any we've ever faced. My own automated production systems. No. No more yaks. No yaks. I have a freezer full of dead, unprocessed yaks because I do not have space for more. Stop sending me yaks. Welcome also to the colony, Amy Goo 22 You rolled an absolute powerhouse of a colonist who will eventually spend their time doing construction and mining, but for now is probably just going to be shoveling yak steak for the next year or so. Welcome also to the colony, Aerobaticat. You also rolled an absolute powerhouse colonist who is unique in that they are the only person in this entire colony who both likes and is capable of growing plants. Congratulations, you just got upgraded to Hydroponics Engineer. Go forth and farm for the rest of your natural life. Finally, welcome to the colony Mars. Also, no, I'm not doing a bit. I had four recruitments in a two-minute span of gameplay. You will eventually be an art spammer. Maybe, if I ever end up caring about art. But for now, you get to join Amy in yak shoveling. So, uh, have fun with that. Now that I have all these new pawns, I need more sleeping quarters. The issue with that being, I do not have a chance in heck of giving my pawns a single room for every pawn in the colony. If it wasn't obvious, I basically intend on recruiting every single pawn that is not actively terrible, and at some point I'm going to run out of mountain. That means it's time to make a dormitory, which will not make my pawns terribly happy, but if I trick it out enough they should at least not hate it. Oh goody! My shipment of raw materials just arrived. But it seems maybe the shipping manifest forgot to, uh, <clears throat> pacify them first. That's fine, hold on a second. I think I have something for this. Oh, well, yep, there we go. So anyway, that was easy. I honestly think I'm just gonna stand up a bunch of walls in the middle of my turret box and stack mountains of ponds behind them, because at this point, cover and accuracy doesn't seem all that relevant. It really doesn't actually seem like it even matters what I do, as long as the mechs get EMP'd and I don't lose too many pawns to their inability to keep their mental dysfunction under control for five seconds straight. Once my dormitories are done, this might be the first time in four episodes that everyone gets to sleep somewhere that is not on the floor. Fun fact, the only thing it costs to make beds is steel, which means either the pawns are sleeping on an empty bed frame without a mattress, or, and this is what I like to imagine is happening, they are trying to use steel wool as a blanket, which is extremely metal in two entirely different and deeply unpleasant ways. To counteract the general suck of having to share a sleeping space with 20 of their closest frenemies, I administer every spare statue in the base, which stacks so many beauty and wealth buffs that the pawns immediately forget their complete lack of privacy and the fact that their neighbor has eaten nothing but yak meat for three years, and the resulting bowel issues that that causes, in favor of admiring all of the cool swag that I've piled in the corner. In other news, my last remaining prisoner, named Coral, goes berserk and attempts to punch their way through a limestone door with nothing but their bare fists. This is, unusually, for berserk rages, a good thing. Because I'm missing quite a few spare body parts in my colony. Non-psychopathic pawns in RimWorld will as a general rule find the process of collecting replacement parts for these from willing subjects to be, ah, uh, quite disturbing and they have a number of strong opinions related to the process that they will start sharing in violent excess if you do it too much. This is, as far as I know, largely unavoidable. 
Even if you harvest on the other side of the world in a completely different map, pawns will telepathically know what happened. What you can do, however, is minimize the mood losses by engineering a situation in which the mentally unstable prisoner accidentally injures one of your pawns, such as, say, by protesting their inhumane treatment. This changes their death from murder to self-defense, and pawns will treat it as a justified execution with a correspondingly milder mood debuff. If this justified execution occurs because part of said prisoner's internal anatomy decides to take a sudden leave of absence, there's also a bug where it won't show up in your colonist moodlets as a successful body part loan, allowing me to get three loans for the mood debuff of two plus a totally justified execution instead of three loans and a cold-blooded murder. Next to be augmented is Fiona TGT. In addition to being just a kind of phenomenal pawn all around, Fiona is the one doing all of my bionics assembly, and the faster they work, the better. Congratulations also to Mars and Minnie for their new relationship status. Meta-wise, I'm not sure it's going to make a huge difference since your pawns are both not terribly fantastic, but I'm glad you two are happy for the five minutes that this relationship's going to last. Speaking of relationship statuses, Goose and Ducky finally did the thing. And in terms of gameplay, this also doesn't make much of a mechanical difference to how the colony works, but what it does do is give Goose and Ducky a massive plus 40 mood buff for 30 days. And everyone else in the colony who's not a psychopath gets a plus 20 mood buff for 10 days simply by attending the ceremony. This basically means no more mental breaks for almost a quarter of a year, and for that reason alone, marriages are super nice to engineer if possible. Meanwhile, on the progression front, with Vacuum Cryptosleep completed, I have researched every researchable thing in the game. That's not to say that researchers are obsolete, mind you, since they are required as part of the ore drilling process, but it does mean I firmly transitioned into a late game colony. It also lets me get rid of my research station and dedicate the space it previously occupied to being a hospital, which is probably something I should have had in advance given the alarming number of massive physical deformities that are present in my colony at the moment. Sometime later, and despite culling my herd by over 40%, I still remain something of a victim of my own yakball success when it comes to farming, and the enormous cavalcade of pelts has entirely saturated my storage areas again. Normal people would probably look at this ball of 13,000 plain leather and decide that maybe, just maybe, you don't need to keep holding on to it. I look at it and see an excuse to make a larger storage area and also fleece the living daylights out of the poor unfortunate bulk goods traders that just flew by. I'm not entirely certain how the logistics of interstellar trading works on the rim, but if nothing else, I think I've figured out why ship chunks keep falling out of the sky. And it's because traders bought so many animal skins from people like me that their ship lost orbit and crashed into the surface of the planet. Oh, that's cute. I appear to have minorly irritated a swarm of underground insects by strip mining their hives, and now they want to eat my brains. Oh no, whatever shall I do? That. That is what I shall do. Eat plasma, you walking sanitation hazards. After a very late endgame transition, my colony is both large enough and stable enough that I'm reasonably confident in my ability to fend off any threat Randy throws my way, which means it's time to turn my attention to the actual win condition for this run, which is, of course, total world domination. This is less of a military problem than it is a logistics one. On average, my pawns will be substantially better equipped and better trained than any naturally spawned raider, so the real challenge is getting my pawns to the places they need to be to clear said raiders out. As near as I can tell, there are two ways I can go about this. Long-range caravan support or directly drop potting in on attackers, but both kind of suffer from the same fundamental problem as rocket engines do because in order to get things from point A to point B, I have to consume other things to fuel that change in position. Those other things have weight, which means I need more things to carry that fuel, which means I need more fuel to fuel the things carrying the weight, and so on and so forth. For drop pod raids, this fuel is everything needed to deploy drop pods, specifically steel, components, and chem fuel, and also launching positions once I get too far from my base. 
By chaining together multiple colonies at the maximum range of a drop pod, I should be able to convey colonists across the world quite quickly. But at rapidly increasing steel and chem fuel costs, plus the additional logistics overhead for every colony hop beyond my home base. Alternatively, I could do a similar thing with caravans. For long range caravans, this fuel would then be yaks fully loaded down with packaged survival meals. When the yaks are in range of a support colony, I would actually be able to fuel them in flight, as it were, with drop pod support, and once they reach the edge of that support, I could then stock them up fully before they exit my range. As the caravan consumes food, I would then micromanage their inventory to abandon depleted yaks that aren't carrying anything, allowing for a substantially extended operating range far beyond the reach of drop pod support from an established colony. There are some real advantages to doing this, most notably that I wouldn't need to establish and supply forward operating bases to provide air support, but Caravans have some issues, namely that they are cripplingly slow on snow tiles, and also yaks will freeze to death in the winter climate, which makes this strategy seasonally dependent. Those two facts render the whole reason for wanting to do this strategy something of a moot point, because if caravans can't survive in the winter, they aren't going to be able to operate at long enough ranges to be worth using in the first place. I could, in principle, use mufflos or expendable ponds with parkas who can operate in colder climates, but drop pod materials are cheap, so I'm probably just going to go with those. Of course, for more local extermination runs, this isn't a problem at all, since I can just fly there directly. Yeah, I'm the pirate now. How do you like them apples, you scheming little thieves? Not so fun when the turntables, is it? This is not, intentionally, an extermination run, though. I'm not going to let the colony survive, of course, but my goal here is actually much more wholesome. I'm here for recruitment. Forcible recruitment. Enabled by electrocuting people's brains with psychic totally made by an architect and not a rebranded AGI voodoo sticks, admittedly. But still, that's way better than being turned into mildly radioactive paste. So, that's nice. In particular, I'm interested in finding some good crafters, but beyond that, I will happily take just about anyone who has traits that don't make them actively crazy. My attacking force consists of eight pawns, partially because I only had eight parkas strong enough to keep people from freezing to death, and partially because my pawns are so jacked that I don't need any more. Among these pawns are Goose and Ducky, of course, along with Vincent, Mars, Elliot Roney, Yamum has the big G, which incidentally takes on a whole different meaning when you look at the size of the charge rifle you are packing. Good grief, I didn't know we ran a bakery out here. Zwan and Rainy. Notable among those is Vincent, who is a brawler and might seem like an odd pick until you realize that Vincent got an upgrade and is now packing an excellent quality Plasteel Longsword and Shield Belt. This combination of goodies, when facing off against lightly armored tribal range units, turns Vincent into one step away from a walking apocalypse. The Shield Belt will regenerate all but the most concentrated of bow fire, and a Plasteel Longsword of this quality is strong enough to entirely remove limbs with a single swing. While Brawlers, and by extension all melee units, are kind of situational in the base game, endgame melee units with Shield Belts are incredibly strong in the areas that they specialize in, and I would be an idiot to not have at least one along on a raid like this, just so that they can draw fire. As expected, the raid is a total curb stomp. One of my targets, named Basser, had a bad reaction to the brain taser and their head caught on fire, rendering them mostly useless. But a second, named Hare, goes down without any issues, and I get a bonus third from a lucky down named Quail, who isn't good enough to be worth recruiting, but, you know, spare parts are spare parts. Hair is also not much good for anything, but a set of hands with the sanguine trait is still well worth recruiting, even if those hands aren't skilled enough to do much other than haul. And with one last drop pod taking Goose away, the first of many pirate establishments has been wiped from the face of the planet. And now I get a deal with the mechs. Thanks, Randy, I needed that. Welcome, or should I say welcome back, to the colony, Astro. Thank you for loaning me your avatar, I'm sure Ducky appreciates it. Or possibly not, because once again, poor Goose gets the short end of the stick in the romance department and ends up breaking it off with this Ducky as well. 
Incidentally, Real Life Ducky was very unhappy to hear about this, and in unrelated news, I'm recording in the doghouse right now. Some days, you just wake up prepared to play 5D chess. In my case, 5D chess with man-eating insects, because the first infestation popped inside my hydroponics farm and it could not have gone better. I immediately span up my freezer banks and set them to work frosting the bugs, and since all the hives spawned inside the heated areas, I would say my plan was a rip-roaring success. As the bugs chill, I do discover that hydrothermic slowdown counts as downing a bug for aggro purposes, and each time this happens, the bugs go hostile for a bit and start smashing things, but fortunately, since there's no colonists in the area and all the bugs are exposed to the same temperature profile at all times, they tend to go down in waves based on their cold tolerance, which means they only really get a couple seconds of smash again before they are all having a dirt nap. After that, it's a trivial task to mop up the insects and go about my business. I honestly gave some serious thought to setting up a bug farm since a properly engineered freezer would let me basically create an infinitely large bug colony that produces infinite meat and jelly for 200 watts of power, but I decided I would instead prefer to have hydroponics again, so I had my ponds clear the hives as well. I might do an underground only run later on or something just to try and design around this idea because it seems really cool, but for now I will decline. Other than the attack of the man-eating spider ball, nothing really interesting happens for a bit. My colony is pretty stable, Randy has chilled out with raids, and other than a minor issue where I actually got my yak reactor under control a bit too much and am now struggling to supply food and chem fuel simultaneously, everything is running smoothly. The no chem fuel part means I can't really launch new raids on other colonies at the moment, though, which is seriously limiting my ability to make meaningful progression. My research tree is complete, and my meta technology is about as developed as it's going to get at this point, because I don't have enough pawns to do anything else. So, I'm a little bit stuck. Bionics help with this to a certain extent, but they're slow to make, and the gains you get from installing them are pretty marginal, so that isn't a solution. I just need more pawns, and unless I get a lucky slave ship, that means I need some way of kidnapping them. Traditionally, when recruiting, you recruit from downed pawns. Enemy pawns, when downed, have a fairly high chance of instantly dying, though, which makes this a little bit tricky, especially considering that that chance of death scales with your colony size. At the level I'm at right now, that chance is very, very high, and when coupled with the fact that most high-value pawns are unwaveringly loyal, which means they're unrecruitable, that tends to make bolt kidnapping and recruitment a little bit tricky. It used to be that pawns downed from blood loss or hypothermia would skip this death on down mechanic, making hotboxes and coldboxes an utterly broken way of managing mass recruitment drives, but that's no longer the case, and they have been brought back in line with combat at base downs. This means the only way to recruit a lot of pawns is now to win a lot of battles. To a certain extent, I might be able to resolve this by raiding other colonies or using shock lances, but so many pawns will be unrecruitable or just not worth recruiting in the first place that this isn't anywhere close to enough to ensure a good selection. And I don't really have very many levers I can pull when it comes to just getting more pawns on the map. Thankfully, not many is not the same as none, and the one lever I do have is a really honking big one. Seasoned RimWorld players are familiar with the idea that starting up a starship reactor will attract unnaturally large amounts of raiders, and seasoned RimWorld min-maxers know that this mechanic works even if your so-called starship is comprised solely of a random nuclear reactor, which, in theory, means that you can construct the other ship parts after the reactor is done. On the other hand, seasoned RimWorld cheese lords who see raids as slightly aggressive lumps of exotic humanoid resources, and consider launching starships as a nice easter egg that lets you get rid of annoying colonists without mood debuffs, instead view this whole thing somewhat differently. Case in point, when I observe this mechanic, I don't see starships at all. I see a structure that massively and controllably increases the raid spawn rate for up to 15 days, at the low cost of 8 advanced components and some random junk that nobody cares about. 
When seeing this, I conclude that Ludian Studios really needs to use some spell checking because they have managed to grossly misspell Raid Beacon. So I shake my head at the low vetting standards of the modern game industry and instruct my colonists to construct a Raid Beacon and activate it pronto. It's time to make some new friends. Of course, not all raids are going to be of a type that will cooperatively walk through my pocket friend recruitment center and the first batch is a bunch of sappers that are not so interested and have to be dealt with manually. I've given some thought to this and I think I can design it so the sappers will go through the freezer as well, but for now I solve this problem with luck and luck with plasma. Well, some of them don't go in the freezer. Some of them do, and one in particular is extremely special and has such good aim that they manage to throw grenades through a wall. This game is uh, not even pretending to not cheat anymore. Either way, it doesn't much matter, because after a few more reality-shattering phobies, the raiders pop a hole in the wall and are melted with half the charge on the fire. I do manage to snag an undergrounder, but they die in transport before I can treat them, so the end result was mostly a wash. I now have a hole in the wall and a really cold base, but nothing much else happens. Now this, this is more like it. Sure, a bunch are probably going to get scythered from the defoliator ship that I totally intended to leave out there and didn't forget about at all, but surely a few of these will trip over some helium ice cubes and stub their toe hard enough to fall in love with my re-education facility. As it turns out, no, not really, because most of the raiders got distracted with the scythers before making it in, and this does not go well for them. I do get one good candidate, though, and they are absolutely stacked. Watkins here is a sanguine body modder, which means that once they're upgraded into the mech lord they always wanted to be, they will have a passive plus 28 to their mood for free forever. Add on to that that they have the great memory trait and a passion for crafting, and I do believe I just secured myself an S tier colonist if recruitment goes well. I also take the time to direct my forces to eliminate the last dregs of the Scythers. The pirates put up a decent fight and spread them all over the map when they ran away, making this about as complicated as mopping the floor, but I don't want to risk any more inconvenient distractions eating up my new friends. The one problem with activating a raid beacon is that it also attracts mechs, which are entirely unrecruitable and are far more annoying to take down than humanoids. Plus, they don't drop anything that I want at this point. I've also upgraded the farm box a bit, as you can see. In addition to slamming down some statues to help give beauty bonuses to the fortification areas to hopefully keep my pawns from going crazy, I took advice from a viewer and placed some turrets behind doors to break up raids a little bit earlier in the incoming raid corridor. This exploit undoes an optimization made to the pathing algorithm that would normally allow large clumps of pawns to group up and share a tile, and it forces the raiders to break ranks into a single file line much earlier than normal because this particular alignment of structures makes it so that they are technically in combat. A pawn nearby the raiders will also do this, which is why I've never bothered with it before, but I do find breaking the clumps up earlier tends to make the feed a little bit more consistent, and consistency saves lives. Rest in peace, Orlean. Another known problem with the raid beacon strategy is that sometimes you get a little bit too much of a good thing. Not like in the I'm in danger way, but more like in the uh, hey save some for me way. I was going to melt these seekers for all they were worth, but no, the mechs had to come get involved again. Greedy guts. Now this, this is what I was looking for. A nice big juicy tribal raid conveniently broken down into bite-sized pieces for easy processing. Also, fun fact, Goose is now very sad because they had kids, somehow. I don't quite know how that worked, but it's nice to know that Goose was a relationship disaster before we even met them. Also, emphasis on the had part of that had kids point. Additionally, welcome to the colony Windex. The fact that you aren't going to be a battle janitor makes me a little bit sad inside, but you are so unbelievably caked up that I'm willing to overlook the irony of that statement, and instead just set you to doing whatever you want. I don't really care at this point, I just need more hands. My freeze box raid yields nothing of interest, and neither does the sapper raid afterwards, at least in terms of recruitment. 
I did run into an interesting situation where I think I broke the game, though. Tribal sappers are basically just free sausage meat at this point. Like, they don't even get to the walls anymore. It's kind of pathetic. Anyway, they get chewed up so quickly that the raids struggle to assign sapping units, which causes them to stunlock and wander around like idiots. That's fine, that part is normal. What is less normal is that my defense is so good on this raid that a group of these sappers just kind of gave up halfway through? I don't quite know how to explain it. The whole ball of them, which was kind of clustered a little bit outside my charge rifle range, just kind of packed up their bags and walked back to where they came in on the map, and then they hoofed it back towards my freezer a little bit, and then they just kind of gave up and left. It was really weird. The next set of humanoid raids, which is, I believe, something like six or seven by this point, yields nobody good again, and by now the flaws in my strategy have started to become apparent. Principle among them is that, despite the combat capacity of my colony not being substantially affected thus far, the ability of my colony to maintain its infrastructure has substantially lapsed. This is entirely the result of the sheer unrelenting mountain of bodies that I have had to process recently, and doing so has worn down my pawns quite a bit. I don't really want to do all of the micromanagement needed to maintain combat capabilities with all this junk around, so I go ahead and deconstruct my raid beacon, returning the rate of raids back to normal. I got like two-thirds of the value from this one, and ship reactors are basically free to produce at this point, so I don't see any sense in pushing it further. Of course, one of the nice things about Randy is that he is well and truly random. I have 23 pawns in my colony right now. That is well over twice what the game generally encourages you to have as part of a mature colony, and it is well past the point where other storytellers will go, nah, you got enough, it's time to stop. Does Randy care? Nope. He just sent me a free pawn from the sky. Even better, this pawn is actually usable for once, which is a pleasant change of pace for Randy pawns. It's also time to show off a fun piece of tech that I normally never have a use for. Crypto sleep caskets and their really inconsistent interactions with time-sensitive pawn behavior. Goose, the disaster goblin that they are, somehow managed to have three children before becoming my avatar. Emphasis on had. They're all dead now, and Goose is very not happy about this. Specifically, minus 60 points of not happy for the next three-ish weeks. This is unbelievably bad, since Goose is both mostly bionic at this point, fully armored up, and in general is just kind of a huge pain in the butt to take down non-lethally. Well, to solve that problem, just put him in crypto sleep. Despite supposedly suspending all brain function, moodlets still wear off when pawns are in crypto sleep, just like they do in regular sleep, even though, because they had their brain function suspended, their skills and needs won't decay. Does it make sense? Absolutely not. Am I going to abuse this? You betcha. Blessed relief comes in the form of exotic goods traders. Sort of. The exotic goods traders don't really purchase any of the stuff that I want to get rid of, namely the enormous warehouse of humanoid and animal hide, but they do sell me psychic brain tasers, which I can use to try and recruit some more pawns in a slightly more efficient manner than swimming in corpses will allow. If the ocean of mech bodies in my farm box didn't make it clear enough already, I'm gonna be really limited to how often I can pull raid beacons down, because... My colony can only process so much raw meat at a time. The bolt goods trader immediately after, though, that, that is blessed relief. Oh, thank Randy above. Please, take my animal hides. Am I going to give you 23,000 excess silver worth of hides for absolutely nothing? Yes, I absolutely am. I just want my storage space back. I'm gonna need quite a bit of time to clean up after my little recruitment drive, so I think I will call it here and let things run for a bit off screen. There is still quite a lot of work to do, but next episode I expect to begin making some substantial progress on Operation Extermination, provided that I can dig myself out again. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed.